So let us go to the book of Jeremiah chapter 23. I appreciate that. 23 and then we're going to read from verse 23. Now how many people remember on Saturday one of the things that the Lord revealed to me as the service was wrapping up was this Tuesday, this particular meeting, the Lord had something for us from Saturday to look forward to. Christian, can you please turn me up just a little? Thank you. The Lord has a special work of restoration for us. Can anybody remember that which I said on Saturday? I shared with you a vision that I saw of a man who had been chained. And even though the chains have been removed, the scars were still there. And the Lord said for us to meet up with him here this Tuesday because there is a bomb in Gilead and that bomb can undo the scars of our previous and past afflictions. Alan, can you hear me shut that other door just so that we get contained in this place? Alrighty. And so, some of you already know the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And the reason why God, in his divine orchestration, allowed for the wise men to come and to bring what they brought. Now, let's quickly go over that because I want to help our expectation today. Because many of us, we have truly been set free. The chains have been broken. The Bible says whom the son sets free is free indeed. But the way you walk around joyful, free, it bothers the enemy. Because every time you praise God and every time you look like it was for you that Jesus died, it reminds Satan of his failure. Now, you may not think about this often, but I want us to think about it now, that Jesus when he was here, he was the word of God that became flesh. And now that he's raised from the dead and glorified, he is still the word of God. And that is the reason why the Bible says forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Because when Jesus was raised from the dead and he was taken up in the clouds, what followed? He was received into glory and the heavenly father said to him, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus is seated. He's settled in heaven. And so being the word of God, one of the things that we learn from that attribute was that all things were made by him and there was nothing made that was made without the word. So technically speaking, whatever situation or person or system or circumstance that we need to understand the best understanding that we will ever have would have to come from the maker of all things himself. You know, things like, we talk about things like marriage all the time. You know, marriage was not invented by the U.S. government and certainly not by the Queen of England. Marriage was instituted by God himself. And that is the reason why you can listen to all the blogs in the world. You can read all the books on marriage. You can be street smart and smart street without going back to the author of it. There is no way you can enjoy the fullness of it. Because that same Jesus that was the word of God at the beginning that made all things remains the finisher of all things. The apostle said what? He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So if Jesus is the one who knows the secret behind all things, if he is the one that can break down the nitty gritty behind all things, then do you think there's anybody that knows Satan better than Jesus? Nobody. And Jesus knew what Satan finds uncomfortable and painful. Now, I'm going somewhere because many of us, we've been trying 
to deal a blow on the enemy in certain aspects of our lives without having much result. And in some cases it's because you are trying to beat an elephant with a broomstick. It's just going to keep looking at you. Like when you tire yourself out, I'm just going to walk over you. We need to know the right weapon. We need to know the right strategy to deal with the opposition that we are constantly arraigned against. You know, we cannot overemphasize the need to have the consciousness of being at war. You see, because the greatest, the greatest trick that Satan ever pulled on the body of Christ was to convince us that we are not at war and that we are not soldiers. But God says otherwise. He says that we wrestle against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. The Bible did not say we do not wrestle. No, the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I mean, I wish it was flesh and blood because flesh and blood gets tired. But principalities and powers, it's like they don't sleep, they don't slumber. They chase you in the daytime. They possess people in the daytime to, to cuss you out, to make your life difficult. And then at night you go to sleep and then they show up in your dreams too. And it's like, can someone catch a break? So those are the people that we are dealing with. So you need to learn from the master warrior himself. That was the reason why they called him Jehovah the man of war because nobody wars like him. And so, how did Jesus deal with Satan? The Bible says that Jesus, when he breathed his last on the cross, he gave up the ghost. You know, because quite often we think that they killed Jesus. But in reality, he was the one that gave up his life. He says, my life is in my hands. I can choose to lay it down. And then after a while, I pick it up again. And that was why he said to the father, these ones are not qualified to take this soul. So he says, father, can you keep it for me? He says, into your hand, I commit my spirit. And then he went deep down into hell, having spoiled all principalities and powers. You know, I told you a story and some people laughed, but in my heart, I knew that they also had the same understanding that I used to have. But then they laughed like, ha, 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 how could you have thought that, Pastor Moses? Ha, 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 ha. When I told you that for a very long time, we thought that the meaning of spoiled principalities and powers was that he put all of them in a trash can and he stepped on them and he crushed them. No, the word, the word spoiled principalities and powers means he took what was theirs. To spoil someone is to take spoil from them, to take that which they already possessed from another. So when you go to war and you overpower the enemy, what do we call that loot? What do we call what you take from them? We call those things the spoils of war. You understand what I mean? We take the spoils of war. And so when Jesus went there, he took that which they had originally taken from man because when God made the earth, he gave dominion to man. And so Jesus went there and he spoiled principalities and powers. And guess what he did? that they will never forget. The Bible says Jesus ridiculed them. He did not punch them in the face. He did not shoot missiles at them. He did not set off a nuclear weapon in hell. What he did was the Bible says that Jesus made an open show of them triumphing over them in it. Simply because Jesus knows that one thing that can truly deal blow on Satan is to ridicule him. Now, let me say this. The Bible says, do not speak evil of dignitaries. That even the, even the archangel Michael did not insult Satan. So to ridicule the enemy is not to insult dignitaries. We call them dignitaries because these are people that occupy positions in the realm of the spirit. And it wasn't me who put them there. The God who put them there describes the order and the hierarchy of their occupancy. But there are certain ways by which you can deal a blow on the enemy. And that is to live a triumphant life. Jesus spoiled principalities and powers and he made an open show of them by triumphing over them in it. 
So every time you are joyful, every time you are fruitful, what exactly that does to Satan is you are triumphing over Satan by making an open show of his loss and defeat. And that is the reason why he tries his best possible to make sure that even though Jesus has given you the victory, you continue to live in shame. Even though the son has set you free, he points at the scars to remind you, to tell you all the time, oh, that was you at church, you were trying to pray for somebody. <laughs> Look at all the problems in your life. Look at the pain that you're feeling in your body. And now you want to pray for somebody simply because if those scars have not been removed, whenever the devil points at them, it will remind you somewhat of the bondage that you were in. But I've come to tell you today that there is only one scar that we need to keep and that is the scar of sacrifice, but not the scar of pain. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he didn't take off his garment and show his disciples where he was beaten. No, he only showed them the one that he willingly took, which was the nail. He says, look, it is really I. The only mark that we need to keep is the mark of the sacrifice for our salvation. But the mark of your pain and suffering by ignorance and in the hands of Satan, that mark is supposed to be removed and erased from you forever. The Bible says that God in his goodness undoes, he erases the handwriting, the word that is used in the King James Bible, I love it so much. The Bible says that God blots out the handwriting of the ordinances of Satan. And so in order for us to fully move forward without Satan being able to take advantage of where we have been is to have those scars completely removed. You know what Paul said? He says, henceforth let no man trouble me because I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only mark the Lord Jesus showed was the mark of sacrifice. Not the mark of pain. And so the Lord says we should come around today and there will be a supernatural removal of scars. God has always been in the business of making sure that not only do you get healed, but that your scars are removed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And scars are going to be surgically smoothed out in here today. Amen. Let me quickly remind you of the story of Mary, because I know that a lot of you were not here when I told about the blessings of Christmas or the gifts at the birth of Jesus. The wise men came from the east. We don't know how many of them, even though Hollywood keeps trying to convince us that there were only three of them, but the Bible never said that there were three of them. So it's important for us adults to know so that when our children come up and they're asking you why only three, you will tell them, no, they were not three. They could have been 300, we don't know, right? But the wise men came from the east and they bore gifts and they gave to the mother of the child three particular gifts presents or three gifts in particular they gave what gold frankincense and myrrh gold frankincense and myrrh and because they were wise men they delivered those presents presents in the reverse order of need because someone who had just given birth does not need gold as much as she needs myrrh but let's go back to the last one that they brought. So they brought gold, they brought frankincense, and they brought myrrh. When someone has just been wounded, you don't immediately apply frankincense because frankincense does not speed up recovery. What do you apply? You apply myrrh. Because when you put myrrh to a wound, what does it do? It helps the wound to heal, but then it leaves a scar. And of all of our existence, we have yet to come to know any other substance that is as good at erasing scars as frankincense is. Because Jesus was born to a virgin Mary. Mary had not known a man. And for a baby to come out of a woman who had never known a man, that body is going to experience some, some, some stretching. But because God in his goodness wanted to restore to Joseph the wife that he borrowed. The woman that he borrowed. 
He made sure that not only was the man applied to heal the wound, but also the frankincense came in to erase the scar. So that poor Joseph does not go to his newly beloved wife and get reminded all the time of what they went through with her teenage pregnancy. And God did that simply because he is the one who has called and the Bible says faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. And then after the scar is smoothed out, God says, now, I know that while you were pregnant, you were probably not working as much. And you, Mr. Joseph, I wanted you to be, to be safe from the ridicule of the people who would have stoned you otherwise because they didn't really believe your testimony. And, and Herod, who is coming after you, I'm sending you to Egypt to get away from all of the mess and I'm going to pay for it. And that was why they brought gold. Because after the healing and the removal of the scar, the gold came for them to start afresh and enjoy the full prosperity of God. Let me tell you something. I believe the Lord is bringing us to this particular point in time because many people have been crying to God for gold in the times that we're in. We have been catching wind of what is really going on in the world. How fiat, what we call money, is about to go away because there is only so much that a currency can lose value be before it completely vaporizes. Because anything that is finite, that is also diminishing, will at some point get to zero and then become a negative. So subconsciously, people have been looking for things that will be of eternal value, things that will last through the difficulty that is in the world. When Jesus was going through his time of difficulty, what did God prepare for him? Gold. God gave gold to the family. When the children of Israel were coming out of Egypt, if they are taking Egyptian money with them, who are they going to spend it with? Who is going to take it from them? The people of Jericho had their own money. And so God gave them something that was universally acceptable. And because we have been crying and praying to God to have mercy upon us concerning the times that we are going into because whether we like it or not, prophecy is going to be fulfilled. God says, I want to give you gold. But first of all, I need to apply the frankincense so that the scar is gone. Because the true treasure that we have is the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. But you know that the scar robs you of the kingdom of God every time you look at it. It reminds you of when you were not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The mistakes of the past, even though you're now saying, oh, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, Satan is still bringing it out and rubbing it in your face. It robs you of your peace because you know what? Satan will remind you that you are still human and very much capable of doing all that which you did in the past to result in the scar. And then lastly, it stops you from rejoicing. You see, as human beings, we need, and as, especially as believers, we need to know the reason why Satan is interested in us. He's interested in us because God has chosen to give us the things that he lost. And you know how painful it is when you see somebody that is supposed to be less than you now getting glorified. That is exactly where Satan and his cohorts are. They lost their place in heaven. Our place in heaven is called righteousness. We have that righteousness identity as citizens of the kingdom of God. He doesn't have that anymore. We have peace. He doesn't have peace. When he went for the meeting of the sons of God and God asked him what's going on, he says, I've just been going up and down, to and fro. He has no peace. He's going around like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. And every time he passes by, you look like you are at peace. And that is when he tries to find where he can man manufacture a storm. The devil does not have what you have and that's why he keeps coming after you for the Bible says the thief comes not but to kill, to steal and to destroy. But I am come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Do you think God is going to give you the treasure of the kingdom of heaven without teaching you how to secure what you have? The same God who says do not cast your pearl before swine. He's not going to allow you to take possession of the true riches of the kingdom only for you to toss it at Satan every time he shows up and scares you with his face. 
And that is the reason why God is taking us on this journey of deliverance and the journey of knowing how to secure what we have and how to procure what we need. Because if we are delivered of all the things that have troubled us without knowing how to engage heaven for a replenishing, Satan will come through the ministry of his demons to fill us up again. That is the reason why it is critical for us to know exactly how to remove the handles of Satan from our lives. Those things that continue to trigger misery, frustration, those things that continue to set us back in our minds. We all know what those scars are. We all know the scars that we have sustained when we put our hands in the fire, even though the Lord said not to do it, but you did it anyway. We all know the scars that we have sustained and by then or by it, Satan continues to do what? To torment us. I don't know about you, but I don't think anybody in this life can truly move forward fully while those scars are there. I know that people have said to us in the world that, oh yeah, you need those scars to remind you of what you have been through. But where will you find that in the Bible? The apostle says, we forgot the things that are behind us. After Paul fought the beast of Ephesus, you know what he says? He says, forgetting the things that are behind. I am pressing forward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. Do you know what marks do to you? They, they only incite pride and confidence in self. I went through that. I've got the scars to show for it. I don't want scars to show for it. I want glory to show for it. I want the goodness of God to show for it. I want you to see me and not even have a clue where I've been so that when I am telling you my testimony, you will be like, wait a minute. There is no way you've been through that and I will tell you, oh yes, I have. He called us to be witnesses, not postage stamps. Because when you see a postage stamp, you know where it's coming from and where it's been. But he's called you to be a witness. It is the testimony that is in your mouth that brings that glory. You know what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 16? The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your heavenly Father in heaven. I will tell you a very true story. When I was about the age of 13, I was in a church meeting and we had a minister who came to teach at our church. And half of his sermon, maybe even 80% of what he was saying was talking about how terrible he was when he was in the world and how he's got scars to show for the victory that he now has in Christ Jesus. And do you know what that did to myself and a bunch of the kids that sat in the back? It made us desire to also be bad for a little while so that we can have stories to tell too. I was one of them. I looked at him and I was like, oh my God, if this is what it takes to preach, I was born again at the age of five. I haven't done anything terrible. I need my own terrible stuff. I need my own scars. And I was, I was going out to get it. Oh yeah, I was so determined because I'm like, I want to be a good preacher like this man one day. I want to be able to tell people, look at the scars of when I was addicted to drugs. Look at the scars of when I robbed the bank. Look at the scars of when I cheated. I am telling you because he came and his boast was not in the Lord, but his boast was in his own experiences. But the Bible says, again, forgetting the things that are behind, we are pressing forward. The only marks that I want to show are the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody boasts in their own marks. It is unlawful to you who is in Christ to boast in your own marks. I say that and I know what I said because someone is thinking here, the theologians amongst us are saying, but if I'm in Christ, the Bible says I am above that, that I am under grace, not under law, so all things are lawful unto me. But do you know that all things are lawful unto you means the things of the law. You are now under grace. So you can do whatever you like because you have been set free, but you also have another law that you have come under and it's called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. We need to make sure that it is balanced theology because the falsehood that is out there is people are saying, you know what? If you are in Christ Jesus, if you are truly born again, all things are lawful unto you. But the same person who said all things are lawful unto you did not stop there. He says all things are lawful unto me. He said, but not all things are expedient. Expedient means extremely necessary. 
And so for me to deliver the things that are extremely necessary, I need to align myself with the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What is the law that I'm no longer under? I am no longer under the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death says a soul that sins must die. But the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus says, if a man be in Christ, though he were dead, yet shall he live. But when I am living that life, the purpose of that life is to give God glory. One of the images that the Lord gave to us a couple of meetings ago, it might have been Tuesday last week or Saturday, was that when light shines, remember me saying that glory is the formation of light that has come from God. So when light is shining, sometimes you don't see it. You don't even recognize like all through the day, light is shining and we don't see it. But guess what happens when you can paint a picture with light? That is glory. And that's why God is saying that you need to let your light shine. But if you're still carrying the scars, they will continue to cast a shadow of yourself, of your carnality, of your pride on the same people that you are supposed to be a blessing to. You see, when you have light, so as this light is shining, if I put my hand up against the light, it casts a shadow. It's difficult to cast a shadow here because there's light all around. All right, but you know what I mean. An obstruction in the path of light casts a shadow. One other reason why the scars have to go is because God wants you to stop projecting your own abilities on people you're supposed to be a witness to. Because those scars are there in front of you and the light is coming from within you. It will cast the image and the shadow of those scars on, scars on the people that you're ministering to. And that is the reason why sometimes people look at you and they really cannot follow your example because they do not have the skill that you have. But when you're sharing your testimony of how you got here, you make it sound like, yes, it was me. It was what I did. Because you have the scars to show for it. Let's quickly read this Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 23. And this is what God is saying. God is saying here, am I a God near at hand? says the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill the heaven and earth, says the Lord? God is saying, I am the only image that you need to project. He says, do I not fill the heavens? Am I not enough? Why do you want to hold on to your scars thinking that your testimony cannot be sweet if you do not continue to make reference to your scars? You know, this thing is two-sided. There is a side of your scars that Satan uses to remind you of your past and there is a side of your scar that you use to glory in your own ability. But either way, the scars have to go. Let's read from John chapter 9, the story of a man. And for a quick second, I would encourage us, if we can stand up, to read this John chapter 9 together. If I thought John chapter 9 might be a bit of a long reading, so we're just going to quickly read Exodus 11 verse 17. That's the only one that we're going to read standing, and we're going to quickly sit back down. Exodus 11, 17. All righty. Look at what it says in Exodus eleven seventeen, 17. And we're going to read that. Um, I'm reading from the New King James Version, so if yours is different, don't worry. We're still friends. Oh, sorry, Exodus 10, 17. Sorry. Now, Exodus 10, 17, he says, Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. Forgive me only this once and entreat your God to take away from me this death only. The will of God for us is to be forgiven once and for all. The will of God for us is to be raised from the dead once and for all. But Satan is the author of the remembrance of our sins through the agency of the scars that we have. 
So while we're still standing, I want us to say, Father, thank you. For you have forgiven me once and for all. Thank you for you have raised me from the dead once and for all. In Jesus' name, let us be seated. This is the will of God for us, ladies and gentlemen. When God has forgiven you, when God has healed you, the Bible says whom the Son sets free is free indeed. There is no remembrance of it. But as long as the scars are there, there is a point of engagement. You know, the devil uses the scars like we use the communion. Jesus says, as often as he have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me, eat of my flesh, drink of my blood, so that we can continue to remember the work that he did, not the things that we have done. I want to say this, folks, because I know that sometimes we don't even know the scars that we have. Trauma allows many of us to bury our inju injuries so deep that we can't even find where the scar is. But let me tell you what happens in reality is whether you can see it or not, others can see it. Because what you're projecting carries the image. And the, and the mark, the profile, and the silhouette of your scars is being projected all around you. And guess who else sees it? Satan sees it. And so one of the things that we're going to pray for today, in fact, I want to say this, one of the things that we're going to thank God for today, because it wasn't a man, it wasn't I who said, oh, I've seen scars on a lot of people. I think it's time we, we did them a favor and, and did some spiritual plastic surgery to remove the scars. No, it was God who said it. He says, on Tuesday, I am cleaning out scars. And so the one who says he's cleaning it out, he knows the deepest parts of us. He says, do I not know the things that you have hidden in the secret place? Am I not the one that fails everywhere? God knows exactly where it is and he is ready to take it out. Now, this is one of the things that the Lord would have me share with you about the, the origin of scars. A lot of us, we know where we sustain the scars from. But the origin of the retention of those scars we need to know what it is. We need to know why those things continue to bind themselves to our hearts. Because the moment we see it, then we can better partner with God in seeing it completely removed. Let's go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9 contains the story of a man who was born blind. Many of us are familiar with the story. So if you come to John chapter 9, and very soon, once we talk about this, I want to just quickly give us some updates of what is going on in the world from the standpoint of a prophetic release so that when people are talking to us and asking us questions, we don't sound like novices. You must not sound like somebody who just listens to the news. You need to sound like somebody who has been with the Lord. You need to sound like somebody to whom the Lord has sent his prophet. You need to sound like someone who knows the mind of God. So we need to do that. John chapter 9 verse 2. The Bible says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was born blind. He was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him saying, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Jesus says it is not about the sin of his parents. That is not what brought this mark upon him of disgrace and of disability. Jesus says it is because of the works of God that have to, the works of God that must be seen. You see, the reason why many of us hold on to our scars, like I said earlier on, is because they allow us to show our own works. And if we don't recognize that whatever it is that we have been through, 
whatever thing it is that we were once plagued with, whatever disappointments, whatever afflictions, whatever traumas, it is because somewhere God has started a mission and a project for glory. You see, until we catch that revelation, that even though it seems like it was my mistake, even though it seemed like it was my disobedience, somewhere behind and before all of that is an intention deep in the heart of God to show forth his praise. We will continue to hold on to our scars. Many of us will continue to shade our hearts from the light of God's healing and prosperity. Simply because you feel too responsible for your mistakes and your crimes. You feel too responsible for your iniquities to even let God take it away. Many of us are too naturally responsible that we're like, no, 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 no. That was not God. That was me. And that was why the disciples did not even ask Jesus, is he blind because of sin? No, they just concluded that if something ain't right, somebody is responsible for it. They just concluded that if somebody was born blind, well, technically speaking, before he was born, he couldn't have sinned because while he was in the womb, he was not yet alive. Or was he? Okay, let's not even go into all of that. Let's just focus on the fact that he couldn't have cursed somebody from inside the womb. So it has to be his parents. You see, that logic still reigns in the world today. Anita, if you write a blog, if I let you use an example of someone who writes blogs, and if you write a blog, and that blog rubs somebody the wrong way, it's your problem. You are responsible for it. They don't think about the fact that the reason why something in that blog is making them uncomfortable is because of what they have inside. The Bible says deep calls to deep. Like I was telling you a couple of weeks ago, if you come to a meeting of communion house and you start feeling tormented, you start feeling troubled, it is not because of what I am saying. It is because of what you are carrying on the inside of you. What we hear is a function of what we have. What we hear is a function of what we have. If I start speaking to you in French now because you do not have the French vocabulary within you, you don't hear what I'm saying. It doesn't even bother you. But if I'm speaking in English because you have the English vocabulary on the inside of you, what I'm saying starts to make sense to you because what you hear is a function of what you have. We forget that if we have nothing, we receive nothing. The Bible says it is, to, it is him who has that more will be given to. That is the reason why God got each and every one of us started with a measure of faith. Because if you have zero, anything that we add to you will be reduced to zero because that coefficient of zero is always zero. And God is like, no, no, no. We're going to start them off with a measure of faith. And he told his Holy Spirit, he said, I want you to shed abroad all of their hearts, my love. Because if they don't have an ounce of love, there is nothing to multiply. Everything is going to be zero. So we are without excuse because God gives us things that we need to be responsible for and to nurture and to watch grow. And so if you are reading what I have written and it's beginning to bother you, why does it have to be me? The reason why it's my problem is because the world teaches us to find somebody to blame. To find somebody to stone. Because if I can make you find somebody to stone and blame all the time, you will never fix you. Because there will always be somebody whose problem it is. Oh, it's always going to be somebody. Let me tell you something. There is always going to be somebody to blame as long as there is somebody else. And while we are busy trying to remove the speck in our brother's eyes, we will comfortably all the time continue to carry along everywhere we go the log that is in our eyes. 
This was the ministry of the disciples because at this particular point in time, they were still just like wondering what was going on in the world. They didn't know who Jesus was really because they didn't know who they were. You know, quite often we forget that sometimes in order for us to get to appreciate who God is better, we need to know who we are more. You see, because a sinner who does not know he's a sinner does not go looking for a savior. You can meet a savior along the way and you just give him a high five or a fist bump and you keep going because you don't recognize that you are a sinner who needs to be saved. You see, quite often we limit how much God can do through us because we limit how much of ourselves we are willing to avail. And so here is a story of a man, Jesus was literally passing by, but because he knew he needed a savior, he reached out for help. But the ones who were walking with Jesus were equally as blind, but they did not even know. Do you know that the disciples at this particular moment in time were still blind simply because all they can see is law and judgment. They could not see grace and mercy. And Jesus was the grace of God and he was right there. But they were still thinking in terms of who do we punish for this man's blindness? Let's go after somebody. You see, without the Lord Jesus, human beings, we are savages. It is unfortunate, but that is who we are. Without the love of God, we are nothing but savages. You're always looking to see the downfall of somebody else and you're always looking to feel better about yourself when somebody else starts to become worse in your own eyes. That is the definition of savage. But these disciples are not the only ones. This can be us on some days. And Jesus said to them, I need you to stop looking for sin and start seeking the glory of the Father. Every time you look at the scars, it can mostly tell you about your sin. At best, it can tell you about your escape. But it doesn't tell you fully about the glory of God. Let me tell you something, folks. There is none of us that comes to earth that is born into this world that God is unaware of. He knows every single one of us even the number of strands of hair on each of our heads, he knows it. And I believe that even if you bought that hair and you fix it, he still knows it. Because there is nothing hidden from God. And so if God knows everything, and the Bible says that to him be all the glory, honor, and power, can I quickly ask you a question, a question that some people ask Jesus? <laughs> they said to Jesus, after Jesus was saying certain things, they were like, okay, now, whatever you were saying before was still kind of okay. They said, but at this particular point in time, are you trying to say that you are older than our father Abraham? And Jesus says, uh, yeah, I am. He says, because before Abraham was, I am. Before you knew how to make mistakes, God was. You see, he told Jeremiah, when Jeremiah was afraid, God showed Jeremiah what he had for him. <laughs> and Jeremiah was like, oops, you may have to find somebody else because this dude right here cannot do none of that. He said, do you, do, are you not looking at me? I didn't shave. I just don't have facial hair just yet because I'm a youth. That was literally what he told God. He says to God, he says, look at me. I am but a youth. What can I do here? And God said to him, he says, look, before you were formed in the belly, I knew you. While you were yet in your mother's womb, I called you and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Some of those nations did not even exist just yet when God was calling Jeremiah. And so do you think that the one who knew you before you were formed, you see, because God does not do accidental things. He knew exactly where you will be born, how you will be born, who will abandon you. He knew every one of those things. He knew how you would try to fight for yourself. He knew how you will attempt to dig yourself out of the hole that you find, find yourself in. God knew every single one of those things. And that is the reason why 
He made sure that at every point in time, he made a provision for the marks that are left on you to become indelible. Let me explain that in another way. If you read in the book of Romans chapter 8, the Bible says whom he did for know, he predestined. And I tell you that predestination is not God trying to force you to do his will. No, because he has foreknown you and he knows the mistakes you're going to make and the choices you're going to make, he sets a path for you to follow. So for his righteousness and for his name's sake, every one of your weaknesses can be overcome if you continue to follow the path that he has set for you. He says, whom he did for no, he predestined, and whom he predestined, he called, and whom he called, he justified. I know that I've explained this before, but I'm going to take two minutes to explain this very quickly. You see, when you write an exam, Seth, you write an exam on a Friday, and the result is not out until Monday. And in the college that you're in, there are companies coming to recruit on Wednesday, based on the performances that the results of Monday would present. Do you know that those companies do not know who they're going to hire just yet because they're like, well, let's see the result. But because God is not in time, God foreknows the outcome of Monday. And so what does he do? Because he foreknows you, he already has the result. You have written the exam on Friday, but God has gone into Monday and he has already seen the result. And it's like, okay, well, based on Seth's level of preparedness, this is the outcome of his performance or the program that he was in. So what I am going to do is I'm going to allow for him to be led by my spirit to sit in a particular place by Wednesday. So that even though the company A that I want him to work for, even though they will not hire anyone of his grade, I would allow for him to sit somewhere wherein he and somebody can start a conversation. And they'll be like, well, even though you are five points below the mark, I think I like your spirit. A friend of mine got hired for a job that he wasn't qualified for because the person who was interviewing him started talking about soccer. And this guy loves football a little bit, just a little less than he loves Jesus. On some days, I think, see, I think he even loves football more than Jesus. And this guy was blown away. And he said to him, he says, look, I don't even have to interview the others. As long as you keep talking like this, I want you in this office. He got the job. After two years of looking. So your positioning by the hand of God determines the privileges that are available to you. And so God is saying, I have foreknown you, so I am going to predestine you. So he's not writing your exam for you. The foreknowledge of God is what God uses to predestine us. So every single one of us, every decision that we will ever make, God already knew. He's not forcing you to make the decision. This is the lie of the world. The world tells you God is the one in control, right? He makes people do whatever he wants. So that means I can just do whatever I want. He's already predestined me. He knows if I'm going to hell or not. No, that's not how it works. He has just predestined. He has foreknown you and predestined to make an allowance for you to always make sure that all your mountains can be leveled and your valleys can be filled for all the crooked path of life to be made straight. And so if that God who's known everything is calling you to love your neighbor as yourself, calling you to prophesy, calling you to go in the marketplace and be the light, then you should believe genuinely that he knows of all the opposition that you will face and he has empowered you to overcome them. So why should any one of my scars make me feel less qualified? Because at the end of the day, the Bible says, by strength shall no man prevail. So strength is not a parameter in the equation of my life. The Bible says strength is not even evolved. When God says A plus B plus C equals D, you see, none of A, B, or C in my life is strength. It is his grace, his mercy, and my obedience. In cooperation with him that delivers my destiny. So, whether I have one million calories of strength 
or minus 100,000 calories of strength is not even in the equation. Because the Bible says strength is not required. That by strength, no man shall prevail. It is not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit. And so, your scars can be used by the devil to remind you of your negatives, but you also at times try to use your scars to remind you of your strength. And God is saying, as long as you fail to recognize that all of these things are so that I can show my glory in you, you will not let me take the scars away. The Lord is here today to remove the scars, but we need to be in partnership with him to surrender the scars, to let go of it. To say, Lord, I put behind all of those things that I feel like I have done well. Because if I don't put behind the things that I have done well, on the other side of that good coin is the bad coin of the things that I haven't done correctly. So Lord, how about if we just let go of it all and let you take the scars, the traumas, and even the confidence that I have in my past achievements and let me begin on this new journey of absolute surrender to the Lord. While we were starting service, Alan reminded us of a scripture. He says that the Lord said that if he, God, does not cut short the time in those days, that not even the elect will remain. Why is this critical? I asked the Lord. I said, okay, I, I get it that you are coming to erase the, the, the scars, but why now? And he said to me, he said, because you need my strength alone for this next season of life. So if there's anything of my own that I am holding on to, it is occupying the place of God's strength. The way that it really works is this. I have a bottle that is a liter. And God says, this one liter, if you would give it to me, I want to fill it with my own juice that will carry you through all the way. And you're saying, Lord, no, 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 no. My little five a my little, what, what drinks do people drink around here? My little Gatorade. That is half of the bottle. I want that Gatorade. And the Lord is saying, no, that Gatorade is not going to get you through. You need the anointing. You need the oil of the anointing. You need, you need my divine enablement. So you need to be ready to empty it out and to let it all go. Because everything that I have orchestrated about your life is so that I can receive glory. It's so that I can show myself and show my works through you. But as long as you're not letting me have it, there is nothing that I can do. We're going to pray, but before we pray, let me just quickly tell you three things that are going on in the world right now as we speak. You see, I told you a couple of weeks ago, and we still need to find the clip so that we can, we can cut it out of the actual message and, and post it in the group and post it online so that you can hear it again. A couple of weeks ago, I was teaching here and the Lord said to me that the wind is coming and it will start to knock off some world leaders. And that in a few days, one in particular will go and we should not mourn because it signals our deliverance. And the Lord in particular said, he says, do not mourn for the leaders that fall. He said, because they are the same ones that have held many captive. I'm not going to name any names, but we know the ones who have held the world captive. And now that the Lord is taking them out, he is taking them out by his own hand. And he told us ahead of time, even if you want to be sentimental for crying out loud, there is a place for prophecy in the life of a believer. And so that has already started happening. The Lord said one in particular will go before the others and several others will follow. And the way the Lord is doing it is the Lord will use the next couple of leaders to fall to take each other out. As I'm speaking to you, some of the leaders are falling. Their mates are only propping them up just for show. But those props are only going to last a couple of weeks. Very soon, another one is going to drop and another one after and another one after. Administrations are about to be toppled in the world. But this is what happens when such, admin, when such leaders fall. Jesus says when you strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And so whatever it is that they've been sitting on will now be up for grabs and many people will contest for it. So there will be wars and there will be rumors of war. The second thing I already told you is that I didn't go into all the detail 
that one of these leaders before she was taken away she attempted to put another in her place of the same kind and the other one of the same kind that was put in her place when I say of the same kind I'm talking about sexuality they are of the same sex in fact they are of the same cater that other one already comes with the devilish agenda of seven things that she needs to do and every single one of them spells war and chaos now don't be scared because the reason why God shows us what is to come is not so that we can be afraid he's showing us so that we can be prepared the third thing that I want to tell us is this. I asked the Lord, I said, because I see a mark on one of the ones that just passed and it's a mark of longevity. And the Lord says, you're right. He says, your observation is correct. So I said to him, I said, so Lord, what has longevity got to do with it? He said, they are watching me. The kingdom of darkness, whatever I do, they try to do. He said, longevity was, the, was a sign in the time of Noah of redemption. He says they are using longevity as a sign of destruction. Do you know that Methuselah lived so long because it was a sign to Noah, a sign of support because he was Noah's co-evangelist? But then to the rest of the world, those that lived and the ones that would come after, it was supposed to be a sign of God's long suffering. Nobody lived as long as Methuselah ever lived. And the day, in the moment, the moment he died, the clouds started to form for rain. Remember, it had never rained on earth up until that time. Some things are about to happen. You know, Saturday I kept prophesying about the rain. I kept using the word rain, 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 rain. See, certain things are about, okay, I'm going to tell you this one for a fact because I have the license to tell you this one. I've been taken to a place where I have seen weapons of war that had never been used before. The technology behind those things have not even been disclosed to the public. Because the Lord says it would do a new thing, the enemy also wants to use new things. Certain things are about to rain. But because it's coming from the thief, it is destruction. Because all he does is to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But the reason why you and I need to know that more than anything else is the fact that there is no, and I'm going to say this very slowly because I've been in a meeting, I've been in meetings with human beings all day, not all day, but most of yesterday and today. But in between those meetings, I am also touching base with heaven concerning the things that are going on. And one of the things that I saw is because the technology behind what things are about to rain have not been made publicly available, no one has prepared the protection against those things. In 2020, the Lord said to me that the enemy is using the next two years as a drill to prepare the soldiers. He says, that time in my books is the time of preparation. So you also prepare. And one of the things that was commonly said in 2020 that was repeated again and again was that the rumor that we were hearing in the news constantly of what was killing people and had the potential to kill more people did not have a cure. I want you to follow me very closely because when these things start to unfold, you must not be ignorant because if you're ignorant, you'll be afraid. Because if I don't know who is with me, I will be afraid. My confidence is in knowing where I stand and who stands with me and the covering that he has over me. So they kept saying, no, there's no cure, there's no cure, there's no cure, there's no cure. You see, it was a warning to every single one of us to recognize that when things are fabricated, using mysteries, they can only be mitigated using the same kind of mysteries. Because we fight fire with fire. So these things that are about to rain on the earth from what the Lord is showing to me, there will be no antidote and there will be no weir to truly hide because they have the power to penetrate man-made defense. That is the reason why you need to go to a more ancient power than the powers that be. You need to put your trust in God 100. 
Simply because the Bible says it is he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High that will abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. And someone says, but Brother Moses, is beginning to sound like some of the things that you're saying will be physical. Yes, they will be physical. But let me tell you something, there is nothing physical that is not a manifestation of something spiritual. If I can settle it in the spirit that the Lord is my shield and my buckler, I don't have to worry about the physical manifestation of his protection. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to a time wherein through the demonstration of longevity, we have seen another Methuselah situation wherein God's judgment is about to reign because Methuselah is gone. Uh, you see, I had a little debate within myself yesterday night. Might have been the early hours of this morning. And I was thinking to myself, I think it's time I had a separate class for people who are ready to consume mysteries so that I can speak more plainly. But this one more thing I would say. You know, the Lord's been telling us a couple of things, not too many, but a couple of things. Things like stop thinking in money. Okay, because the time is coming wherein even if you have it, you won't be able to use it. But start thinking by faith. You know, Isaiah was a prophet to the church. And one of the things that he said was this. He says, come and buy you who have no money. God is saying, I want you to think about possessing things without thinking about you buying them with money. Because those who put their trust in the images that are carved onto wood, which is money, he says they are trusting in that which cannot save. And he's talking about the time of the separation. We have come to the time of the separation, wherein the Lord is separating the waters from the waters. Is that that you believe in God or you don't? Is that that you trust in him or you don't? But there cannot be place for mammon in your heart. There cannot be place for dependence on your own abilities and your own strengths. Any preparation outside of trusting in God is about to be put to shame. You know, I said it on Saturday and I'm saying it again today that the caves that they made for themselves in the hole of the ground, the Bible says it will shake so much that they will beg for it to fall on them. So this is what we need to do. I want you to come with me to take a look at a verse of scripture here real quick because we need to get it and then we're going to pray about everything else that we have said. Hold on one second. Let me just find it for you here real quick. Alrighty. So, let us go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. Okay, this is something the Lord said for me to do. Let me just pull this back a little bit. Okay. So, can you just look at me for one minute? What I'm about to read to you is about to happen. That is the seriousness of things right now. What I'm about to read to you is about to happen. So let it register that what you're reading is not fairy tales, is not just some kind of prophecy that is meant to be for a generation of 70 years to come. What I'm reading to you is about to happen. So let us look at it together. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15. And this is what it says. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, this is verse 5. Come and see. So I looked and behold a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. And then I heard the voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. You know, we've broken that down extensively. And we've analyzed it and we've talked about the fact that it is inflation, it is famine, which is 
an elaboration, to, so to speak, of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, of the pestilence that will come. And when he said, the moment you see the pestilence, he says, then you know very well what will follow. The, the, the commotion will begin. So now let's look at what that commotion looks like. Verse 15. It says, and the kings of the earth. Okay, so let me, let me do you a favor because you are not all men. The guys that were on the men's call on Monday, remember that I said that the way God separated the waters from the waters was by introducing the sky, which is called the firmament. So when you look, you see that blue thing that you see, that is the sky. And that is what is holding up the waters that are above from the waters that are beneath. Okay? And so I said to them, before the Lord made the sky, what happened was all the waters were together in one place. And the Bible says the Lord separated the waters from the waters using the firmament of the heavens. And now we are seeing that as it was in the beginning, it's becoming like that again in the end. So the sky that holds up everything that is in heaven is what is keeping the things in heaven in heaven. The Bible says, God says, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Genesis chapter 1, separating the waters from the waters. The waters above, what did he call them? He called them heaven. And the waters beneath, he called them seas. Track with me. The sky was holding things up. Now look at what God is doing here. Let's read from verse 13, just for your benefit. Right? It says, and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky, the same sky that has been holding up heaven from coming to earth, the Bible says that sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the mountains and the islands are being removed from their place. And I told you exactly what it means. This is like parable, but I already told you what it is. Those kings of the earth, those principalities. You know, there are principalities that look like just you and me. You can touch them. But sometimes they don't like you to touch them because they know if you touch them, sometimes you mess with their, their resonance. But there are principalities that look just like you and me. And they have been removed from their place. And I already told you, when they get removed, don't mourn. Because they have been removed for your sake. The Lord promised Ezekiel, he promised the church through the ministry of Ezekiel that he will overthrow the ones who have been in power so that his children, the ones he chooses, can come into power. So you should rejoice. Look, sentiment has no place in the season that we're in. You know what the Lord said to me today? He started saying it to me yesterday, but I didn't really grasp it until today. He said to me, he said, what you defend will defend you. The Lord says, what you defend will defend you. So if you, if you keep defending people who are doing foolish things, in the day of trouble, all you will have to defend you is foolishness. Let me say this in another way. You have friends who are doing badly, but because you are so sentimentally connected to them, the judgment of God is looming. The warnings are coming, but you don't want to hurt their feelings. So you continue to defend the friendship relationship that you have with man. In the day of trouble, what you have defended is what will protect you, is what will defend you. God is saying you need to defend the truth. So that in the day of trouble, the truth will defend you. I defend the truth of the word of God. So that in the day of trouble, that truth of the word of God will defend me. Because the Bible says it is the same measure with which you measure, that it will be measured back to you. So what are you busy defending? Are you defending ungodly things? I mean, let's face the fact. Some of us are defending our political affiliations even though we know that certain things that have been said within those political agendas do not align with scripture. But you do not want to let go. You don't want the hand of your political party to fall. Okay? That is your allegiance. 
in the day of trouble, you will have nothing but that political party to defend you. Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my heavenly father. So re-examine your affiliations and your alliances simply because to whom you pledge your allegiance, you will get your protection. That is the reason why the Lord specifically say, I don't want you mourning because I am the one removing the islands and the mountains. The Lord is removing them. And this is what will happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 14 says, the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. Do we have anybody in here who is a student of prophecy? If you study prophecy and you want to know more about prophecy, can I see your hand up? Okay, let me give you a little gift here. Whenever you see scroll, it represents time. So when the Bible says the time the scroll was rolled up, it means time is up. Okay? Go and study your Bible. Whenever you see scroll, it is telling you of a timeline simply because things are written on scrolls and the moment you get to the end of the scroll, that means there is nothing else that is written. It has to be written first before it happens. In the life of Jesus, Jesus says, Behold, the Son of Man goes as it's been written of him in the volume of the books. The moment God drops his pen, that is the end of that chapter. So when they rolled up the scroll, they are telling you, Time up. This world system is over. A new one begins. The earth remains. What part are you getting ready to play? We need to have our consciousnesses awaken, awoken because the ones who have been the lords of the earth have been lords for so long they have made the rest of the world to think like slaves all the time. You know that expression that we use all the time? Oh, but they haven't fixed that road. Oh, they haven't done this, they haven't done that. Who is the day? You know, we always say, oh, maybe one, one day they're just going to do a bridge here. They, we're always using the word they. They, and it's because subconsciously they have taken the power from us. If I, we gave it to them, you make all the decisions. You possess everywhere. Just give me the passport to that country. I want to be able to go there. Whereas when the Bible says that it was given to you and to your children. And so that is the reason why we're screaming here, we're yelling, we're shouting, because we need to wake up now. We can't enter the next chapter of human existence as ignorant zombies because there are some people that are waiting to lord over us again when we get there. The people that are lording over us today, they started their journey on God's instruction as children of God. Go and read about them in Psalms 82. In Psalms 82, God says, but you are my children. And I have given you charge over the earth that you may protect the weak and uplift the, protect the poor and uplift the weak. He says, but what have you done? You have become oppressors. He says, I've given you the power to live like gods, but you would die like men. It's right there in Psalms 82. You know, I've been reading Psalms 82. Some people who come to my private classes, my private classes are spontaneous. If you find me sometimes when I'm in that mood, I can teach for four hours. People like Alan, he has suffered that a couple of times. You know when he just thinks he's passing by and I hold him down and I drug him for like four straight hours. And one of the things that I've been doing is I've been telling them about Psalm 82. I said because I have been at the presentation in heaven when they were talking about the change of God. Yeah, the change of God is happening. Yeah, Michelle knows what I'm talking about because I said it on Saturday, she wasn't even here, that the country that uses that expression the most is experience, is demonstrating it to the world the most right now. If you know, you know. Here is the deal. Verse 15 is where we're going. It says, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? I want to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen, to stand with the Lord. I want to encourage you to make the Holy One your habitation. To put your confidence in God. To put your trust in God. 
The only thing that is keeping us from the entire army of Satan is the sky. Because their war is currently, well, let me not use the word currently loosely, okay? Because we're no longer in the month of August, so certain things have already come to the ground. Because first of all, remember that before the sky was fully receded, the stars of the heaven have started falling to the ground. And who are the stars of the heavens? The angels. You remember that when Satan, the dragon, was cast down, he pulled in his tail, what, a third of the stars of the heavens. So some of his agents have already arrived. They are boots on the ground. They arrived before the, the full army of the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is just the order of things. And I've been teaching around that for a while. But there is a particular kind of machinery that has yet to be dropped on the ground. And that is because the sky is holding it up. The Bible says, and there was war in the heavens. If you roll off the scroll of the skies, guess what happens? They bring the beast of the machine. And once again, that beast looks like a man and is about to make himself known. Okay, let me say this. I said about two, but I've seen it. Even on earth, some people have already seen him. So what does that mean? It means we have come to a time wherein if the Lord is not your shield and your buckler, in the day of the Lord's judgment, you will scream for help rather than call his name. So that, those are the three things that I want to tell you. But as I was speaking to you, there was a fourth thing that was brewing in my spirit. And I don't take it lightly when the Lord shows me his blood. And so it was brewing in my spirit. I see the blood of Jesus made available and the ones who need it standing and they're not making contact. So I want to encourage you, you need to dip yourself in the blood of the lamb. You see, because that is the only way calamity will pass over you. At the time of Exodus, the ones who were not behind the blood of the lamb, they were swept away by the spirit of death. And that spirit is going to make rounds very soon and you do not want to be caught in it. If what I'm saying to you today makes you feel a little afraid, you have work to do. Oh yes. If you feel a little bit afraid, you have work to do. And what is the work that you need to do? You need to find where you, you, must, you should be standing and stand there. Because if you're already standing there, these things should be like music to you. You should be rejoicing and be excited. Because Jesus told them, he described a bunch of calamities to them earthquakes, pestilences, and all of those things. And then he said to his disciples, he said, when you see these things, look up because your redemption is drawing near. So when people are cowering and looking for places to hide, you should be running to the mountains because it's like, man, Jesus is about to set foot upon the Mount of Olives. I am not hiding under the rocks. I am going to the rock. Praise the Lord. Let me bless you with one verse of scripture and then we're going to pray. Revelation chapter 7 verse 12. Revelation chapter 7 verse 12. Ada, Mary Ann, let me just tell you, the Lord says to me that you need to go to them and tell them what you now know. Because if you do not go, how will they know? The Bible says how will they know unless we tell them. But how do we go if, you, if we have not been sent? But indeed, now you have been commissioned. You have been sent. You need to tell them. You need to engage them because their fears have become mightier than their confidence in God. And until they hear your testimony and your bold declaration, they will be overpowered in the great day of the Lord. So you need to go to them. You already know who they are. The Lord is going to guide your steps. You see, the Bible says, Oh, no man, nothing but the love. You are not doing it out of a sense of, of, of indebtedness, but you're doing it because you love them. Even if they, they seem like they don't want to hear it. No, but you need to say it. You need to go to them and you need to declare it. Michelle, this is what I want to tell you earlier on. And um, okay, I'm going to tell you later on because I need to give you a scripture. In fact, I can give you that scripture now. Before we read this Revelation chapter 12, you open your Bible to Matthew, Matthew chapter 12. Michelle, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 12 or 7. And um, as I was seeking the face of the Lord today, it showed certain things to me concerning you. And look at what the Bible says in, um, in verse 7. It says, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. If you know what it means that the Lord desires mercy over sacrifice. What have we been praying for in the last couple of days? 
we have been praying for the mercy of God. You see, because the Bible says it is, the, it is not of him that runneth, it is not of him that willeth, but it is of what? Of God that shows mercy. So this is what the Lord said to me. He says, tell Michelle to up our expectation beyond her preparation. Certain things that you have already acquired in the industry that you're in, with the business that you do, continue to set your expectation of what level you can operate at. The Lord is saying you can go up higher. Be ready to go up higher. That is where you begin your own next season. As we're crossing over, it is confirmation. Praise the Lord. God is good. I, I see you telling me more, so tell me more afterwards. But then the Lord showed that to me. I was dusting the cobwebs around the house and I literally saw you almost to one side of the wall. And the Lord was saying that's where she needs to be. But these are the things that are guiding her expectation. You see, the Bible says it is not of him that runs or all that wills, but it is of God that shows mercy. The mercy of God is what is elevating us. I'm going to crack a little joke. I hope it's funny. My wife, I've been telling my wife, I've been telling everybody, we need to pray. What have I been saying? Don't ask for money. Don't ask for money because the money you're asking for is probably not what you need. Ask for the mercy of God. I underestimate, I underestimated how clever my wife is. So we got home at night and we were praying. I mean, I was already getting in the spirit and getting excited. And then we heard the voice of the Lord. The Lord spoke to her. What she said, she was hearing of the Lord. I heard it in my heart, so I knew that we were being addressed together in that same place as we pray. I want to encourage you couples, pray together to the point wherein you will have visions together at the same time. You understand what I mean? And so, guess what my wife said? My wife says, by your mercy, send money. Look at what she did. Because I said, don't ask for money, ask for what? Mercy. She asked for mercy with a little bit of an addendum. You see what I mean? But whatever we do, we can get creative all we want. But this season, ask for mercy. You see what I mean? Hallelujah. Ask for mercy. So what is that verse of scripture that we are going to read? Revelation chapter 12 or 7. And what does it say? It says, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But glory to God, verse 8 says, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Isn't this amazing? That the Bible says, as far as heaven is concerned, there is no place found for them. The way there's not a place found for them anymore in heaven there will be no place found for them in your lives anymore. The Lord is saying, I don't want to leave anything in you for them to come and hide in. Not even those scars that remind you of where you have been. The Lord is saying, let go of everything. You cannot constitute for yourself an access of evil. He says, let go of it. He says, because I'm doing my part. I am eradicating those voices that you've been hearing. There will be no more place for them in your life because there is no more place for them in heaven. Come the day. You see, you are about to have a series of dreams. As I looked in your direction, I saw it. It's almost as if you're watching a TV show. You watch one episode, you watch another episode, you watch one episode, and you watch another episode. Now, let me tell you something. Wait until the last of those dreams. And the way you're going to know the last of those dreams have come is there will be a period of drought when you don't have those dreams. And then you go back. It is a message. But don't jump the gun. Don't try to take that message because some people will become apparent to you in those dreams. And you may want to do something about it. The Lord says, no, wait until it is all complete. And when it is complete, let me tell you something what you have been waiting for in terms of purpose, in terms of the call of God upon your life, is going to be made bare. The Lord has chosen to bring those things to you in a dream. But just wait. They will follow each other in a regular pattern. And once the drought comes, rejoice. Because then the message is being collated for your delivery. There is something that needs to be canceled over several people in here today. You see, the Bible says that the borrower is servant to the lender. And many of us have borrowed Many of us, we owe, whether on your house, over your business, or because one day you want to buy that Versace bag and you didn't have enough money and you borrowed it, it doesn't matter. 
I am telling you we have come to a time wherein your focus should not be on what you have done wrong. Your focus should be on God's deliverance. So I don't care how you got into that debt, but the Lord says, I am bringing a cancellation of the fear of slavery over your life. Because as long as you owe and you haven't paid, the Bible says the borrower is servant of the lender. And God is raising kings and priests, not servants and slaves. So every fear that has come into your heart through debt is being canceled. Praise the Lord. Don't wait until the IRS has written you that they have canceled your debt before you attain your freedom. Don't wait until your friend says, oh, uh, uh, don't worry about it anymore, Alan. I, I, I don't want that money anymore. Don't wait, don't wait, don't wait, don't wait. Because the Bible says whom the Son says free is free indeed. The freedom that is going to make you a mighty one on the earth comes from the confidence that you have in God, not on the records that you have on paper. It is being cancelled. If I let me tell you what I saw. The moment I said it is being cancelled, I was saying what I was seeing. It looked like a bamboo forest and it's been cut down. I asked the Holy Spirit very quickly. I said, well, why bamboo? Of all the trees that you could have shown me. He said, because bamboo, they grow very quickly. He said, a lot of those people, the debt they owe, has grown very quickly in interest and all of those things but God says I am cutting it all down I don't want you to continue to live in fear can I give you one more thing before we pray come with me to Mark chapter 3 the book of Mark chapter 3 we're going to read verse 3 Mark chapter 3 hey Holy Ghost I'm excited about this I am excited about this because there are people here who have been waiting for this work of deliverance so Mark chapter 3 verse 11 Okay, what does it say? You know, I've been saying this thing to you for a while. The Bible says in verse 11, and the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out saying, you are the son of God. Before he spoke, all they have to do is see him. And then they were convulsing. No, <laughs> they were shaking. All they had to do, let me tell you something, and this is the moment where we rise to break bread together. I want you to do this prophetically with such a desire in your heart to not be where you have been, but to be where God wants you to be. A lot of what you are struggling with. And now angels, this is the time for you to take your place next to these ones because they are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. Take your place next to these ones, the ones who are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. Take your place. Now I want to just say this quickly because I'm, we're having this conversation and I just want to get it resolved. If you're standing here and you're not confident that you are an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus, you don't have that confidence that yes, that Jesus has truly redeemed you and you are one of his. I want you to come forward real quick so that I can pray for you. If you're not confident that you are an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus, I'm giving you one more opportunity. As the Lord has given to me, I'm extending to you. Come forth, let me pray for you. Alrighty. Anybody? Nobody. So now you can do what you have been asked to do because by their own attestation, they stand ready for your ministry. And I'm speaking to the angels that are on assignment for this meeting. You see? Because when I told you last week that this kind goeth not but by prayer and fasting and I broke it down to you that Jesus was talking about the ministry of angels is because Jesus ministered with angels. And so we need to do the same because they are ministering spirits to those of us who are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus. So be ready right now to receive help and Knowing supernaturally that you have help allows for you to stand tall, to speak boldly, because now you know that the ones who are with you are more than the ones with the world. Gehazi, Elisha's servant, was terrified at the sight of the army of Syria. But Elisha was like, are you being serious now? You're afraid of what? He says, my master, can you not see them? and the host of them. 
Elisha was like, you are seeing the host of men. I'm not at that level anymore. I don't even see them. He says, I am seeing the host of heaven. And so he wiped his face off. He said, now begin to see. And Gehazi happened to then see the angels that surround them. And it was like, my master, my master. The angels are even more than the terrorist. The angels are more than the opposition. You see, your heavenly father will not leave you comfortless. He that is within you is greater than the one that is within the world. And the ones that are with you are more and mightier than the ones that are with them. So what do we do? We show up with confidence. You see, Jesus just had to show up. And they were trembling. I want you to equip yourself with this mindset and with this revelation. Because as we're having a change of God, the rascals will want to show and flex their own muscle. But guess what? They will not come near you. Because when they see you this way, they will go the other way. I told my wife today, I said, the Lord came to me in the early hours of this morning and he said to me that the ones who have troubled me in recent times, he says he has taken over from where I left off. And I almost started to feel sorry for them because the Lord says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. But for some reason, men allowed themselves to be inspired and agitated by Satan to become an instrument of dishonor in the life of the anointed. And the Lord said to me, he says, because they have somewhat aroused your wrath. He says, kiss the son that he may be well with you. He said, because if you arouse a little of his wrath, his heavenly father, the one who put him there as a king and a priest on the earth, he's going to come after you. Because I have an assignment to complete. I have visions to share, prophecies to deliver. I don't have time to be chasing flies. My heavenly father says, I've given my angels charge over you. And so this is the rich season that we're walking into. Let me read this thing to you again so that you get the full import of it. He says, unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out saying, you are the son of God. It is a progression. This is where we're going. You know, we have been through communion house. We have been through a time where an unclean spirits will come amongst us and they will start to manifest and they will start causing trouble. The lying spirit in them will come up and they will start telling lies. The aggressive spirit in them will come up and they will start. Let me tell you something. Recently, I had an altercation with somebody and my wife said to me, she said, the moment that I saw him, I knew that he was confused about his sexuality. So because his sexuality is out of order, he doesn't recognize any kingdom order. He's a man of dishonor. And when he saw me, that spirit that was within him started to manifest. At first, I was going to let it go, but the Lord said to me, he said to me, open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. He said, rebuke that spirit now. He said, because that spirit is not just in one man. He said, that spirit is in several, but if you don't rebuke it, you will give it access amongst you. If you don't move in this authority, it is a wasted authority, it's a wasted privilege. And you have no excuse when they trouble you. So guess what? When they see you, the reason why they will scream and be begging is because they saw what you did to the last spirits that tried to trouble you. So every spirit that troubles you, now let me say this very quickly. I know that there are about three people in here, family members that are close to you have been troubled in their dreams. They keep having bad dreams. They keep having nightmares. They keep getting troubled. If you're here and someone's been telling you about dreams that are tormenting them, even if it's your child, can you raise your hand? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Alrighty. I'm going to pray for all of y'all who keep your hands up. And I'm going to put a scripture in your hand. Come with me. In fact, let me, just, let me just declare over you. Okay. The Lord says it is important. Job. I'm going to put this scripture in your hand. Job chapter 1 verse 9. But while I am reading, I want you to say to yourself, I am is anointed. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Nobody has any rights in heaven or on the earth to touch me because the Lord has put his name upon my life. Alrighty, let's go to the book of Job. Job is just right there before the book of Psalms. And we're going to read the very first chapter in Job, Job chapter 1. And we're going to read from verse 9. 
Job chapter 1 from verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear you for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. He says, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and it will surely curse you to your face. You see, Satan is like, oh, I would love to do something. But if you, God, don't remove the hedge, there's nothing I can do. He says there is a hedge of protection around him. We've been going around him in circles. We've not been able to penetrate because of the hedge. Satan was not able to do anything even though he hated Job. You know the word Job means to be hated. God blessed Job to the point wherein Job became hated. You know, after a while people are envious of you and there's a little jealousy, after a while it becomes hatred. And they will look for every way to debase you. Somebody sent one of their employees to our office the other day. And the employee was misbehaving. And I told my wife, I said, the reason why that employee has no respect is because his boss was speaking bad behind us. The Lord showed me. And that's what happens when people want your business. They want to do better than you. They start to hate you. So Satan hates Job. And he was like, I've been trying. I've been going back and forth. But there's no way we can penetrate. How did he know that the hedge is impregnable if he hadn't tried? He tried, but that hedge is impregnable. So those of you who have your hands up, I want you to say, Lord, let your hedge of protection be around the minds and the hearts of my loved ones in the mighty name of Jesus. So I want to declare over you, so whether it is in their dream, whether it's when they're awake in their thoughts and in their imagination, they will not be afraid because they will be confident in God's protection around them. The word of God says, as mountains encamp around Jerusalem, so does the Lord encamp around those who put their trust in him. So one more thing that we're going to pray for, and before we have the general prayer, that we all have the communion is this. I want you to say, before you say, just hear me. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot worship God and worship idols. Okay? You cannot believe in your own ability and also believe in God's ability. And so one of the things that you have to first of all renounce is confidence in self. And say, Lord, I am not confident in myself. In my own abilities. I am confident only in you. And in your grace. Have mercy upon me. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because from this moment now the work of the erasure of the, of the marks of affliction, of accidents, of mistakes have been erased right this very moment. Lord, you brought us here right now for this purpose and so let the ministry of your angels be fulfilled right here, right now in this place in the mighty name of of Jesus father our confidence in you will grow even in the face of opposition it will grow in the mighty name of Jesus now let us break bread together and as we break bread together today we're going to do another job and this should be one more reading and we can wrap it up nicely we're going to do another job and the Bible says if I when I there was a time in my life wherein for like a period of one year a lot of the promises that moved my life forward came from the book of Job. A lot. There's a lot of promises in the book of Job. Do you know that there's a promise in the book of Job that when you leave your house and return nothing shall be amiss. Oh yeah. Nothing shall be amiss. I left my apartment and returned. I was living in someone's in-law suite. And there had been a storm that blew away several people's roofs. It did not spare the roof of the place where I was staying. And the roof was taken in water. And when I came in, I looked up and the entire roof, about a third of it, was soaked up. It had taken in water. But none of what I had in there was touched. 
and I looked up and I said, Lord, I'm happy because this is the promise. The Bible says in, in Job chapter 5 verse 24 that I would leave my habitation and when I return, nothing shall be amiss. I said, nothing is amiss. I said, but this roof is the landlord's problem, but I don't want to stay here anymore. And the neighbors called me. They were like, I hope you're not affected. I said, not really. I said, but the roof looks horrible now because it's got watermarks. They said, you can move into ours. It's brand new. Nobody's ever lived there. I stayed there for a whole year. Zero money was paid. And on top of that, they started feeding me, even without me asking for it. And they were a better cook than I was. So let's go very quickly. Job chapter 7, verse 11. Job 7, 11, and what does it say? It says, therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a sea serpent that you set your God over me? This prayer is a warning. Job did not understand by the time he was saying this what God was doing in his life. So he said, I will speak out of my anguish. He was like, what is, why are you so much after me? But if only he knew that God was making room in his life for twice as much as what he lost, he would have been giving grace to God, giving praise to God. So the Lord said to me, as we're breaking bread today, to tell my brothers and sisters that what is about to befall this world system is not against you, it is for you. Don't cry out in anguish when they say there's a casting down, you say there's a lifting up. Let nothing of the outside pressure you enough to feel like God has turned his back on you. These things are happening for you. The pestilence, the famine, the earthquakes, the seals that have been unveiled, the trumpets that have been blown, even, as I was telling you, even. What do we have? We have the trumpets, we have the seals, and what else? Say that again. Oh, come on. The bowls. Even the bowls that have been poured out. Every judgment that has been poured out is not for you. You have already been judged and you have been found the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Do not come under any pressure. Job allowed himself to come under pressure and he started talking nonsense. Don't worry. If the Lord is for you, no one can be against you. I say these things because some of us are too close to some people and they are not under the shadow of God's wings because they are not in the secret place. When you see their pain, it might make you want to say, oh God, you're a good God. What is going on? No, hold your peace. Simply because the Lord says, if you cannot speak evil, do not speak at all. So this is the warning. So I want you to pray and say, God, do not let me cry out of pain. Let me give you praise because I know you are in control. I want you to say that, personalize that prayer. Pray that over yourself that you're not going to give in to pressure. No matter what is going on in the world, no matter how high the fence of opposition is, you will not come under any pressure. You are not grasshopper in their sight. You are a king and a priest and an overcomer upon the earth. In the mighty name of Jesus. Alrighty, let us break bread. As it is our custom, we make the pronouncement that the Lord Jesus himself made. He said, this is my body when he took the bread and he took the wine and he says, this is my blood. He says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. And so we'll do the same here today. We say, Jesus, we receive this bread as your body. This is your body that was broken for us. As we eat of it today, we eat unto courage. We receive confidence to trust in you like Jesus trusted in the Father while he was on the cross. We say like he said, Father, into your hand, I commit my spirit. You may eat of the Lord's body. And the Bible says he took the cup and he says, this is my blood. So we receive this wine today as your blood. So this is the blood of Jesus. 
that was shed for us. As we drink of it today, we receive his life into our body. We receive his mind into our souls. We have the mind of Christ. We will not be moved. We will not be shaken. But we will remain steadfast even in these evil times. In Jesus' name, you may drink. Anita, very quickly, let me just uh, say this over you. The goodness that you have enjoyed is the goodness of God. It is not a coincidence. It is not because people are tired of troubling you. It is just because it is the goodness of God. So do not entertain any fear that maybe things are reverting back to how they were. Even if they want to go there, the Lord is not going to let them. Because what he has done stands forever. So you stand your ground and do not entertain any fear. Because the Lord revealed to me as I was about to drop that cup and I saw you and you were looking with suspicion to say, wow, is things, are things reversing? No, the Lord says that affliction will not arise. The Egyptians that are behind you, they remain behind you. Be confident in God. And let me say this very quickly. If I see me afterwards, let me just quickly share with you a couple of things regarding to your business. You see the ones that are bringing you that break in this new business that you're in, they are already ready. They are just preparing to meet you. So you don't have to worry yourself too much. God has already gone ahead of you. So be confident in him, but I can tell you two or three more things afterwards. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, God is good. Now, just sit down for two more minutes. I want to tell us three things that we need to take home as assignments. I want you to add these three things. Don't replace your assignment from, from Saturday. Remember, your assignment from Saturday is a long given assignment that we haven't done, which is what? Psalms 103 verse 7, which says that the Lord showed to Moses his ways, but the children of Israel, they only knew his works. You understand me? We still need to continue to meditate on that until the Lord begins to reveal his ways to us. Now, but the Lord is saying to me very quickly, in fact, I know that time is fast spent. I'm going to read one of them to you. The rest of them, I'm just going to tell you real quick. So come with me to the book of Matthew chapter 12. Come with me to Matthew chapter 12. Now, this is something that I want us to take home and then meditate on it. 1233, this is what it says. In fact, I'll give you all, I'll give you the next two from 33 to 35 so that it's easier for you. Matthew 1233 says, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruits. So I want you to begin to pray for your fruits. I know that is contrary to what we think. We usually want to pray for the tree so that the tree can provide, can prepare, can work, can provide good fruits. But let me tell you something, the mystery that God is unpacking to us here is that you by faith can call the things that are not as though they were so that they can be. Begin to declare goodness in your fruits. If you're a parent here, your children are part of your fruits. Begin to declare goodness over them. If you, even without being a parent, whoever you are, you are supposed to be a fruit-bearing believer. Begin to call forth your fruit. You know the fruit of the Spirit. You know what they are. Whichever one is not yet apparent in your life, begin to call it forth. And the more you speak forth concerning your fruit, you will make the tree good. That's what the Bible is saying here. It is either you make it good or you make it bad. But because you are professing by faith that your fruit is good, your trunk will be good. Your thoughts will be good. The Lord will begin to give you mysteries to align your mind and to renew your thoughts. Let me give you the next one. The next one is in 34. He says, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The Lord took us to the book of Philippians. In fact, what did I tell you on Saturday? This one is easier. That we need to meditate on the things that are true. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of a good report. Why? Why do you need to meditate? Because the things that you focus on, you magnify. So when you meditate upon the goodness of the things that you find in the Word of God, it grows within you and it begins to overflow and those are the things that come out of your mouth. So I want you to say over yourself as you meditate and pray that my heart will overflow with a good theme and I will speak that which is good. Do you know that when the day of the Lord comes, only those who call his name will be saved? Some people, rather than calling the name of God, a swear word will fly out of their mouth. Some people will say that, oh, I'm dead. No, because if you say you are dead, then you will be because the day of the Lord is a day of power. What you say happens. But the ones who call upon his name will be drawn and received into his salvation. 
And so you need to start to prepare yourself now. The power of life and death are in the tongue. Let's skip to 37. I'll give you the third one. I think I've made this assignment very simple. So 33, speak to your fruits. 34, fill your heart by meditation with good things. 37, he says, for by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. When thoughts come to your mind as you're meditating on Matthew 12, 37, and you remember things that people have said concerning you, say that which is right concerning you. Let me tell you what most of us do. When we remember the hurt and the pain of what people have said over us, that they said that we can't make it, the doubt that we are even called of God. You know, people will come and say, who, who do you think you are? Who says that you are called? Who says that you will make it? People will come and condemn you. In fact, let me tell you one of the most common things that we struggle with when we correct people. They say, who has made you the prince over us? When Moses showed up to announce deliverance to the children of Israel, rather than them saying, hey, thank you, Lord, for deliverance, they were like, who is this one? They said, who, who, what gave you the audacity to come and speak as though you have some authority? When Jesus came, was it not the same thing they said to him? They said, how come this one speaks as if he has authority, but he's not one of us? The mistake the people that were in the time of Jesus made that cost them several generations was they decided to protect the temple rather than protect the Lord. Because Jesus was preaching in the mountains and by the sea and they were losing members in the synagogue. They attacked him, they got rid of him so people can come back to their old religious setting. What they protected was what they were left with. In 70 AD when the Romans came, the temple could not protect them. That's why I'm telling you what you protect is what will protect you. So if you keep protecting unrighteousness, ungodliness and foolishness in the day of trouble, that's all you're going to be left with. But if you defend the truth and the righteousness of the kingdom, it will protect you when it matters. So I want to encourage you folks, whatever anybody has said to diminish the authority of God upon your life, Jesus says, by your mouth, you will undo the condemnation. By your mouth, you will speak justification. Demons keep talking to us all the time, telling us that we are not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it is okay for us to see ourselves as filthy. Say, no, I am of the order of the house of Aaron. I'm a priest unto my God and my linen garment is not soiled. Begin to speak. Let me tell you something. You cannot overcome Satan by just thinking through the temptations. You have to speak. Many of us fall for the same temptation every time. Because when Satan comes and he says, hey, you know, if you go to that, that aisle of the store, there are magazines there with pictures that, you know, will excite your body. And you're like, no, I'm not going. And you're thinking in your mind. But before you know what's going on, your steps are going to that place. Because the Bible says that your steps are quick to do evil. So what do you do? If you are just thinking about it, there are people God tells you not to call. And you're thinking, I'm not going to call them. And then before you know what's going on, oh, oh, you're already calling them. The key to overcoming is by speaking the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. So what do you do? When those thoughts come, speak and say, no, I'm not going down that aisle. I'm not looking at those magazines. I'm not going to that website. I'm not looking at those images. I'm not making that phone call. I'm not allowing the flesh to get the better of me. Speak forth because if you keep quiet, you become weak. David said in silence, my bones grew weak within me. And the devil is looking for you to become weak so that he can swallow you. You know that he's a serpent. So he wants you to become weak and lean so that he can swallow you. But when you're speaking, you have strength. So those three things, please, this week, meditate on it so that the next time I see you, I can tell that you are doing something about these assignments. All right, praise the Lord. Let me just quickly pray and close out the meeting and then we'll take some announcements and the offering. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for this particular point in time. We thank you for this meeting and we thank you for the ministry of your angels. Father, that which you have commanded us to do, that which you have reminded us to accomplish, will only be fulfilled by the unction of the Holy Spirit, by divine enablement, together with the ministry of angels. And so all of these things that we need, we already have. Father, may we not abandon our privileges. May we not shy away from our responsibilities. But let us stand as good soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ, even in these last days, to do the work of evangelists, to give glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we just celebrate Jesus and just give him thanks. Praise the Lord.
God is good. Alrighty. So the offering basket is here. If you have a check or an envelope or cash that you want to put in there, please make use of it. And then the rest of the offerings will take them online through those various electronic means. I just want to remind you again at Communion House, we take offerings as a means of what? Of worship. The Bible says, honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruit of your increase. So this is another symbol of our worship. We're not giving to meet needs. We're giving to do what? To worship the Lord. So I want to encourage you, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. So while we're preparing our offerings, I want to just go through this announcement very quickly. Um, I think my wife will give us the details on Saturday. But in October, there's going to be a women's retreat, right? And it's going to be in Helen. We're not going to put the address on there so that nobody tries to come and wait for you people at the door. But <laughs> for those who register to go to that conference, um, to that retreat, um, I want you to do this, okay? very quickly I want you to make a list of the things that you want God to do for you in that time and let it be things that empower you not things that indulge you so that you don't waste all that time away from your family things that empower you not things that indulge you but it's coming up and it's from the 21st to the 23rd of October is that even wealth yeah that's good because that's like a week after my birthday right because I don't want to have my birthday and my wife is away in another country you know what I mean Yes, so that's good. So the 21st to the 23rd, and um, um, do people have this already to send to their friends? Okay, that's awesome. So please, let's keep ourselves reminded of that, and we still are going to have service here that weekend. Okay, so it's not a holiday for men. Okay, we're still going to be here, and there might be some women who are not going, even though we encourage every woman to go, but if you're not going for some reason, please come here. We're still going to have service. Okay, and then finally, this Saturday, we're meeting in here and I just want to encourage you to come with an expectation. If you have a physical Bible that you read at home, I want you to bring it with you on Saturday. Okay, if you have a physical Bible that you read at home, I want you to bring it with you on Saturday. I have experienced a miracle before when it comes to my physical Bible and it changed my word study life. I want to be able to share that with you. So when you come on Saturday, you, you can bring it. Don't be ashamed even if it looks rough. That means you've been reading it. And if you have not been reading it and it looks brand new, don't worry, we will not judge you. Just bring it because one of the things that I would love for us to do is lay our hands on those Bible and make certain decrees that would allow for us to not longer sh shake in our commitment to the word of God. So please don't forget, make a note, send yourself a text on Saturday. I am bringing my Bible to church. Praise the Lord. Let's rise up and just say a word of blessing over the offerings. The word of God says to bring in all the tithes and all the offerings. And for those people who are honoring the Lord and worshiping the Lord today with their substance that I've given into this purse, may you not miss your reward. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. This season will be a season of experiencing more intimately and more deeply the love of your heavenly father because that love always wins. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Very quickly before we go. Ah, thank you Lord Jesus. I said certain things, but in particular, I talked about the ministry of angels today. Many of us, the problem with us is we're trying to do everything. And the Bible says he has given his angels charge over you. Feel free to use the angels that God has assigned to you. The Bible says they are ministering spirits to you as an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus. And one of the things that I know, because I've been a member of this body of Christ for quite a while, is that many of us do not use the ministry of angels in receiving revelation from God. That entire book of revelations that you're looking at was not delivered by the hand of God himself. Jesus came, of course, and said certain things to John directly but most of that volume was by angels they will bring him this scroll they will bring him that vision a lot of what Daniel saw he saw by angels and so why do we think even the apostles when Paul and Silas were broken out of jail it was by the hand of angels when Peter was broken out he was by the hand of angels but the world has managed to paint the picture of those little babies with tiny wings that can do nothing but amuse you as angels the angels of the Lord are mighty 
and they are ready to go to battle on your behalf. They're ready to go up to heaven and bring you what you ask. So begin to ask when you're studying the word of God. Say, Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. I thank you. Now the revelations that I may be missing, angels begin to go up and down the ladder. Say those things and see whether there will not be a difference in your study life. I want to encourage you. The Lord told me that today to encourage you to not leave that privilege unutilized. Speak to the angels that he has assigned to you. God bless you. I'll see you Saturday, God willing.